First off, I want to mahalo the, the organizers of La Hoi Hoi Ea who've been doing this for the last 30 years. Let's give them a hand. You guys don't know, starting off with Papa Kikuni Blaisdell, doctor, uh, one, of our, one of our leaders, one of our grandfathers of Aloha Aina. Rest in peace, Uncle Kikuni. I um, want to mahalo. Uh, first off, I want to mahalo some of our volunteers. I want to mahalo Brother Oren, who's doing sound. Brother Oren, who's doing Olelo right now. Let's give a hand for Brother Oren. I want to give a hand for our Kiai. All of our Kiai, uh, our Kiai are wearing red bib ribbons. And our Hawaiian Kingdom uh, security, you see them around here. Um, the idea of political independence starts with us, the, with the ability to feed ourselves, ability to police, uh, to, to hold ourselves accountable. So that's what we're doing, right? Um, I don't want to make some space up, up for community announcements. Um, so throughout our panels, we definitely have um, opportunities for, for you to come up. Just tap me on the shoulder if you want to make an announcement in between. So if you are part of the Women Voices, come up right now. Come get to the panel. Come check us out. I want to mahalo our Kiai. You'll see our Kiai wearing red ribbons on their left, on their left arm. Um, our Kiai are spaced out throughout. Um, we have about six Kiai that are CPI certified trained. I want to mahalo them. I want to mahalo Auntie Leilani Teo for doing a Kiai training uh, for us. It's another great example of community empowerment, community engagement. Um, I want to mahalo uh, Hui Kulike Kako, our Ohana from YNI. Every Sunday they have work day, sustain, uh, super sustainable Sundays, um, where they, they, the idea is that they're working up there at Kaala Farm. Hui Kulike Kako. Great Ohana. I want to mahalo those guys. Um, I want to send a big mahalo to um, Brother Daniel Anthony, Hui Aloha Aina Momona, who helped um, do the emo up at Thomas Square. For all of our speakers, for our volunteers, and for some of you guys, if we get extra mayai, we got some food from the emu. I want to mahalo you guys there, so please go up and get some. Um, you'll start to see when everybody with the red ribbons is eating, that's the time to go. Okay, so we got about a minute to go here with Women's Voices. So if you're part of Women's Voices, come on now. Let's get in here. We're about to get going. Um, I'm like speaking this way, but the speakers is all over here, yeah? Portagui, yeah? Portagui, that guy. Um, oh, I want to make another mahalo to uh, Brother Pete Doctor, a great ally, great friend of ours for allowing us to use his sound system. Mahalo, Brother Pete Doctor. Mahalo, uh, Olelo Media. Now, if you are somebody who is uh, Facebook Live, you want to encourage that. Please use the hashtag LHE2017. That's hashtag LHE2017. Uh, please hashtag that if you're Facebook Live. If you're doing any pictures, uh, please do that. Again, um, I want to mahalo all of you great people who are here for La Hoi Hoi 2017. Uh, this is the discussion tent. A great, great, um, a great example of how uh, we can model ourselves of coming together of a topic, discussing, discussing it, um, and really contributing. So we got about 30 seconds. I want to mahalo all of you guys uh, for sticking it out here. We're going to have a great panel here coming up with the women's voices. So let's get aloha aina. Aloha aina, you guys ready? When I say aloha, you guys say aina. Aloha. Aina. Aloha. Aina. When I say aloha, you say aina. Aloha. Aina. Aloha. Aina. All right, all right. So I want to uh, first, uh, I'm going to introduce... The title, I want to introduce the, uh, the moderator. She'll go ahead and um, introduce her panel of, of speakers. Uh, okay. <laughs> We're it's all very okay. However, <laughs> so Kim's, Kim's going to set up the format. She's going to set up a, 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 well, first, I want to introduce a great friend of mine who is, I'm introducing her panel. Uh, this is part of Women's Voices, right? Women's Voices, Women Speak. Um, they went to Okinawa. They're going to give a report, solidarity. Uh, my good friend, Dr. Kim Kampak. Let's give a round of applause. Let's go, guys. Check it out. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for making time for us today. Um, as Joshua said, we're part of Women's Voices, Women Speak. And um, 
our format today. We only have a half an hour, so we're going to speak kind of briefly first about who we are, um, what we represent. And we're going to, Ellen's going to talk about the um, U.S. military agenda for the region that we're up against. Um, and we're going to talk specifically about the solidarity trip we made to Okinawa and what that represents to us in terms of linking our island sovereignties together and what it means for us to have a vision of genuine sovereignty and genuine security for Hawaii, which we take very seriously, but also for the region in general. Um, because of course U.S. empire works transnationally and so we as activists have to work that way as well. Um, and then afterwards we want to engage with y'all because we have big plans for next year and we want everybody to get excited about our big campaign. So, um, okay, first we just need to acknowledge um, some of the kapuna in the room. Auntie Tere Kiko'olani, who is there at the very beginning. Um, the fifth occupation of Koho Olave. If we have an analysis of gender, an analysis of environmental degradation and what that means for a free Hawaii, Auntie Terry has been a key leader for us in guiding our thinking as individuals and as an organization. I need to mahalo her. I want to acknowledge also Uncle Johnny Verzon, who's here in the back. Yes, um, two of us here on the panel are Filipino heritage people. And a lot of times we get confused in Hawaii about how we articulate our story with the Kanaka Maoli story. And, and Uncle Johnny was there also in the 70s, blazing that trail for decolonial Filipinos in Hawaii to think in a different way outside of U.S. empire. We need to mahalo Uncle Johnny. Thank you. Yeah. And so many other people and friends and wonderful people. I won't, I won't use all that. We only have a half an hour, so I'm going to move quickly. Um, just a little bit about me um, so you know... Uh, I am um, Filipino on my father's side um, from, hey, more people, awesome. Um, Kuhuku, Filipino immigrant plantation family. Uh, <laughs> um, my mother's side is Howley military family uh, from Alabama. They met in a place called Kwajalein in the Marshall Islands. And so I'm here critiquing US military, but I cannot say that I stand outside of that system because like many of us, uh, U.S. military is what brought our families together, yeah? And again, we're trying to think outside of what we've been given, and that's part of what we represent today. Aloha, everyone. My name is Ellen. Um, I'm of Ilocano descent, and I was born on Maui. My grandfather came to work in the sugar plantations there, and he brought over his family. Um, so I've been part of Women's Voices with Auntie Terry since 2004, and our friend Gigi Miranda. And since then, we've been bringing folks like Elise. We went to Puerto Rico with Elise. Um, we went with a couple other sisters to, uh, uh, other folks went to Puerto, uh, Puerto Rico, or we did, and Guam. And um, so it's been really a, such a blessing and opportunity to learn about all of these nations and how we're all being um, affected by militarization, but also how we need to stand together. And also as someone of, you know, part of the plantation history here, a lot of the people that come from the militarized places that we went to are also living here in Hawaii. So we really work to try to make those connections across our ethnic backgrounds so we can uh, remember our history of resistance and also the problems uh, that affect us all. Aloha mai kako. Uh, my name is Joy Lehunani Inamoto. Uh, my father is Hawaiian, Japanese, and Scottish from Maui. Uh, my mother is African-American, Cato Indian, and Punjabi Indian from Texas. I was born in California. This makes sense. Um, it has been my pleasure and honor to have joined Women Voices Women Speak and to go to Okinawa. Um, I'm really here just to talk about how you guys need to come to our other tent where we're doing some alternative mapping. So when we think about solidarity, yeah, and when we think about how do we make these connections to our sovereignty and why, how do we get other people to care about our sovereignty? We have to care about other people's sovereignty. And so we have to remap the world. And so we've done a map of the places that, of the countries that, were, that came to Okinawa this summer uh, that we're gonna be talking about, that they're gonna be talking about, uh, that are also dealing with US occupation and fighting and resisting. 
um, and how they're remapping those spaces and reclaiming those spaces and making those spaces sacred again um, and not giving up and convinced they will win. And so when I look, when I went to Okinawa, that's the thing that I gained the most. And so it was, how do I rethink space and how do I rethink winning? Um, and there were many, many, many other struggles that came up in Okinawa, but that's another uh, story. But so uh, if you guys get a chance uh, after this, uh, come over to our tent and like put your story onto the maps that are drawn. They're on the ground. And you can say whatever you need to say. You can share a little story, a line, a protest statement, love, a heart, whatever you want to do, and just add to that so that we can start rethinking our spaces in new ways. Yeah, mahalo. Okay, everyone, so I'm going to start in just sharing some of the information that I learned in the Okinawa meeting, specifically the problems uh, that we are facing in the region, uh, but also how we are trying to organize against that problem. Um, so I, I also wanted to say that this piece, um, okay, first of all, I just want to say this June 22 to 26, we went to Okinawa for the International Women's Network Against Militarism gathering. There we reported about Pohakuloa, the depleted uranium in the bullets and the bombs that are littered in the soil, being kicked up by the blasts and the winds affecting the surrounding communities. We talked about the danger that the Navy fuel tanks in Red Hill poses to Oahu's drinking water along the south shore. We talked about the Hawaiian movement that stopped the bombing of Kaho'olawe and restoring the land and people's relationship to it. We reported that the United States has outright stolen Hawaiian Kingdom lands and then built military infrastructure on top of it. We corrected how the U.S. miseducates people about U.S. annexation and statehood and interrupt how Hawaii is seen as America. We had to because so many from around the world, even places that we are from, from the Philippines, etc., they settle here looking for work, thinking they can just assimilate into American ideas of success and forget where they come from and where they are at now. Our delegation to Okinawa wanted to show how Hawaii's movement for demilitarization needs to bridge indigenous people and settlers. It needs to be inter-ethnic to heal the way that empire and militarization destroys our ancestral lands and tries to pit us against each other. So I'm going to share the report of the findings from Okinawa is a poem only because there's a lot of information and I want to try to share as much as I can in a way that helps you see the patterns of the problem that we're facing. The Indo-Asia Pacific Rebalance Policy, aka the Pacific Pivot, grows in name because it is expanding U.S. military presence in the Pacific region by 2025. Now it's including South Asia and the Indian Ocean. Each nation state should be more equipped to protect its mutual security with the U.S. This means continue to fear others labeled as terrorists. China and North Korea are propped up as threats. Mutual militarized security. Korean activists on the ground teach the North Korean threat is propaganda to keep the status of forces agreement and U.S. military presence in South Korea to tell the lie that North Korea is enemy. Remember the armistice between North and South, reunify the peninsula. Japanese peace activists fight their own status of forces agreement that allows US bases there. After World War II, they could not have a military because of its imperial past. But now Japan concentrates their US bases in Okinawa where the battle took place and environment and lives of Okinawans are still sacrificed. There's a sympathy budget and self-defense force. Conservative Japan wants to support the US military agenda. Filipina activists fight the visiting forces agreement that allows the US to conduct jungle warfare training with the armed forces of the Philippines. Muslim, indigenous, and displaced farmers resist the theft of their lands for corporate extraction and military aggression. They are labeled terrorists and New People's Army. The VFA has evolved into the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement to expand U.S.-Philippine military exercises and infrastructures. 
Strong man Duterte stands by U.S. military presence to discipline Marawi and the martial law in Mindanao. The U.S. keeps neo-colonial Philippines as little brown brother to watch China and pimp the South China Sea. Turtle Island folks spoke, about, spoke against collaboration between the domestic police and the U.S. military. It's called Operation Urban Shield. Excessive use of force lead to deaths of unarmed black, black and brown people. Black Lives Matter. The militarization of the Dakota Access Pipeline project is aggressive against water protectors. Water is life. Land theft and imperial assimilation. Chamorros are fighting the Mariana Islands range complex, imprisoning their islands and seas as war training zones. The Texan, home of ancient Chamorros and mother species of endangered tree, slated for destruction by live fire training. The Merck serves as a Western Pacific corridor to connect with Hawaii's military sites in the North Central Pacific. Puerto Ricans are fighting to self-determine their political status. A plebiscite asks these questions. Do you want to be one, independent or free, associati free associating? Two, keep current territorial status? Or three, join the US? 70% boycotted the colonial election. 27% of registered voters voted for statehood. These movements root their problems in the Indo-Asia Pacific rebalance policy. It is connecting these places to weaponize our oceans and lands. It's being strategized and implemented from right here in Hawaii at Camp Smith Pacific Command and various security research institutes in Waikiki and the University of Hawaii. We need to flip the mutual militarized security script towards one of mutual genuine security. We can make connections between indigenous Hawaiians and working people from these militarized places and stand together against militarism, corporate extraction and destruction of our environment. We can create decolonization and demil education for all because all of us need ancestral help to do the long haul work of building societies that don't depend on bases and wars. Mahalo. That was a lot. <sighs> Ellen knows how to break it down. Thank you so much for that. Thank you so much. Um, so I have two parts to my talk. The first is a little quiz on Okinawa, because I don't think we get enough information. Has anybody been to Okinawa? Anyone? Anyone? One, two, three, four. All right, so you guys are going to score really high. We know that already. So Okinawa, the Okinawan archipelago was its own Ryukyu kingdom for four centuries until the Japanese annexation in 1893. True or false? Somebody said true. Somebody said true. 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 Mostly true. It was 1879. So Japanese annexation happened 14 years before US annexation of Hawaii. Yeah, but it was four centuries of its own kingdom um, before that. Yeah, very cosmopolitan place, very um, international in its outlook on the world, um, and then annexed by the Japanese in 1879. So Okinawans get a little hot under the collar when you just call them Japanese like it ain't no thing. I speak Japanese, but mind your manners on that one. OK, just mind your manners. Um, the U.S. has 32 bases and 48 training sites in Okinawa. True or false? True. True. And that question is cl closely linked to this, the, the next question. Okinawa's main island is slightly larger than the size of Kauai. False. It's slightly smaller. Smaller in square miles. Yeah, and so you can imagine 32 bases in the space of that. And I'd like, can I get a helper? Anyone? Someone be my helper? Way to be. Marco, right? All right. So just to give you a sense of what we're talking about, you can just pass that around so the folks can see what it means to be uh, another island that's under U.S. military occupation, but 32. So uh, when, when, pe when people say the U.S. bases are in Japan, that's where they are, and that's what it looks like. Okay. Um, next question. In the Battle of Okinawa, more than a third of the population was killed. Within three months, almost 150,000 people, and more than 92% were left homeless. 
150,000 dead civilians and 92% homeless. True or false? It was true. And just to give you a sense of that, right? So we're looking at, you know, in terms of square miles, about the same, 466 square miles Okinawa, 552 square miles Kauai. In Hawaii, we lost 2,400 people in Pearl Harbor and 770 through combat. Yeah? So it's a level of catastrophe, I think, that our brains just, if you grow up in this context or U.S. context, it's just hard to understand that level of catastrophe. But to meet an elder in Okinawa, you can feel the mana of what that means as soon as they open their mouth because they survived the war, they survived the aftermath of the war in terms of disease and destruction, they understand that the base represents war and that war, they don't use a Christian framework, but the way that I interpret it, war is a sin at the deepest level that we cannot tolerate. And um, it's very powerful to feel that level of conviction that, that, that people are so certain of when they say no base, no base, no base, and with every force of their body are there outside the, the camp, camp Schwab making sure that that doesn't happen. Um, the last question, the dugong is the cultural icon of the Okinawan people that is under threat by the controversial military base currently under construction in Ora Bay, the dugong. Yes, that one is also true. I don't know if you guys saw us at the IUCN last year, but there's these really adorable dugong hats this local sister made, you know, making sure we know how precious the dugong is, Okinawa. Um, and this is a beautiful brochure that lays out not just the dugong, but 5,300 other species that are under threat by this base. Sister, can you help me just pass that around so people understand not just what folks are up against, but what people in Okinawa are trying to protect. And that's so much in alignment with what we're doing here, right? It's not just, ah, or against, but like, this aina is sacred. You know, what is what we want for this aina, the vision that we have for peace and sustainability, making sure that that is in the forefront, yeah? What, we are, what we're for, what we're trying to protect. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk story uh, with some of our pictures. It's picture time. Um, this is another pic. Um, just let these go around. I will help. So this is a mo another picture of Ora Bay. You can just go like that. And then on the back, you can see Puhakuloa, Jeju, some other sites that our network has been trying to uh, bring more attention to and make sure that people see the connection between our sovereignties. Um, this is a picture of Joy <laughs> on the day, and, and the rest of our contingent. On the rest, on the day, uh, Irinohi is the is June 23rd. We were really privileged to be there on the day of remembrance. And um, what's I talked about the civilian deaths, but what really moved me in Okinawa is that they make no distinction between civilian and military. In terms, um, they make no distinction between national origin on the day of remembrance and the way that they talk about the number dead. So it's a real commitment to peace, not some nationalistic notion of what we want for our people. It's like, no, all these people who died, we will honor all of them today. We'll honor all of them. Anyway, so Joy was there. Um, do you want to repeat what you said to the Okinawan people? No, it was, we all cried that day. You, were, you had a heart of stone if you didn't cry on that day. So, anyway, so that's a little bit what we did. Um, in terms of our statement of solidarity, it was about linking our island sovereignties, you know. Do you want to add to that at all? Or? And that we share the same occupier, yeah? We share the same occupier. And anyway, this is a picture of us at Okinawa University. We made a, a banner that says, o uh, Hawaii stands with Henoko against military expansion. Thank you, Joshua. You can pass that around. Um, there's, there's members of our contingent who couldn't make it. Kasha Ho is here in the, in the audience. Thank you, Kasha, for coming. Lisa Grandinetti, uh, who's a, a union uh, organizer with IKEA. Tina Grandinetti, who's her sister, who's done a lot of Aloha Aina work here in Hawaii. He's now in Australia. Um, Ellen, of course. And Aiko Yamashiro, who represented us um, so beautifully ah, on the water. One thing that we saw that was really powerful, the el like I said, the elders are there on the line outside Camp Schwab, and they're sitting there in the heat every day. Is a visible sign of protest. And then some of the younger folks are on the water, challenging 
the police, challenging the workers, challenging Japanese government, U.S. military, who are there. And this is Aiko on the mic saying, Aloha Aina! Aloha Aina! Aloha Aina! And bringing uh, the love that we have for our islands to Okinawa and bringing the love that they have for their islands back here and just sharing the mana of that was just so powerful. This is a shot, um, these are all courtesy of Joy Inamoto, these photographs. This is a picture of kayak activism, okay? On the land and on the water. They're coming to us by land and water and air and sea and we're gonna do the same thing. And this is um, the military police there and the kayakers challenging the orange buoys. The orange buoys basically keeping fisher folk out and saying, you know, this belongs to the military now. And the people in the kayaks saying, oh no, it doesn't. This has been our ancestral fishing ground for the last four centuries <laughs> or, or whatever. So very powerful to see that level of activism. Um, I wanna go to the bottom part here. When I said the elders on the line, this is just, I wish I had like a panoramic, but this gives you a sense of what we're talking about. In their 70s, eight, I mean, Okinawans live long. They look 70, could be 90, you know. <laughs> like, um, really amazing. And I, I didn't get to stay long enough with them, but I want to just, just honor this elder here, Fumiko Shimabukuro, 98? 88, excuse me, 88 years old. Um, I, for those of you who were at Nohua Ea last week, I, I, I uh, made mention of her. She used to work as a maid for one of the bases. And then um, a U.S. colonel said to her, oh, the war in Vietnam, that's not even about killing people. It's just business to us. It's just business. And that was her wake-up call to really understand more deeply what it meant to participate, even as a worker for the U.S. military. She is just tough as nails. Fumiko Shimabukuro. She, uh, if you look her up on YouTube, you can see just how fierce this kupona is, just like, Amazing woman. Um, and this woman here is also amazing. She w helped organize the conference. Suzu, oh, thank you. Auntie Suzuyo, this is her outside the vigil site where Rina Shimabukuro, she's a 20 year old young woman who was raped and murdered last year by a former US um, Marine. So you can imagine how powerful it was for us. Actually, like, it's a vigil site where her body was found and it took over a month of her being missing until her body was found. So uh, you can imagine what that was like for us to be there um, as a women's organization, as, w as an organization committed to drawing attention to the gendered effects of militarization, the environmental effects of militarization, and to be there at that site was very, very sobering reminder of the impact of militarization on the freedom of, of girls and women and gender nonconforming people in general. Um, so I'd love it if we could just say her name, Rina Shimabukuro. I'd like to also say the name of, um, gee, I'm really bad. Right here in Hawaii, Ivy Harris. She was murdered in 2013, excuse me, by um, US military personnel who's now in prison. Jennifer Laude. She was a sister in Olongapo in the Philippines who was murdered. Um, by a U.S. Marine, who's also in the military now. I mean, excuse me, who's also in, in prison now. Um, not long enough sentences, but I mean, I know the prison isn't the perfect solution, but for a long time, those, those rapes happened with no consequence whatsoever, you know? And so our movements are making an impact that these crimes are wrong. You can't come to other people's countries and rape and pillage and pollute and act like that is just your imperial might and that's what you get to do. Um, and this I thought was a very powerful image as well. I wanted to share this. This is outside that site where Rina Shimabukuro's body was found. Um, a poster, no base, no rape, no tears. Um, and uh, the father of that young woman has been a really tireless fighter in the anti-base movement as well. And I thought this, this tells a, a powerful story um, of what people are fighting against. And um, yeah, I think I'll stop there so we can engage with some more question and answer. But um, thank you all for listening. Thank you so much.
give an opportunity, an opportunity for uh, some question and answer uh, for, for a few minutes. So we got the first question over here. Aloha. I was just wondering, it's unfortunate the U.S. occupation of both Hawaii and Okinawa, but here in Hawaii we have native gathering rights that allow us to go on to military land without too much harm. Is there anything like that in Okinawa for the people there? Does this one work? Can you, can you guys hear me? No. no. Uh, the, the, the types of protections that are given, even environmental protections and gathering rights and stuff, Okinawans are not under those same types of protections um, in the same way because uh, I, I, I did not hear that they had the right to gather. In fact, um, they look to Hawaii quite often to look at the way we fight for things. Um, in ter especially for environmental impact stuff. One of the biggest things that came up was the issue of the osprey. Um, we hate the osprey here, right? Um, that's not even a question for it. Like, we hate it. But it's, I want you to imagine being at home every day, um, and every day there's an osprey over your telephone wire nonstop from 9 in the morning until 10 o'clock at night. Just hovering. Just hovering, hovering, possibly hitting the telephone poles, possibly crashing. That's what it's like to be in Takai. Um, to the point where they, the children cannot study. They, they, they have constant headaches. Uh, folks have, if, when, the, when, the, when the ospreys finally do land, uh, they can't, they have headaches for over an hour. That's the minimal over an hour for the adults before they can think straight. So the idea of something as beautiful as native gathering rights, does, I mean, that's like, that would be a dream for them. Um, they don't have native fishing protection. So, um, I mean, we, ne we really need to think about that. So as we push for things here, it does have an impact. And that's why we really have to look at the way our sovereignty works here. Um, does that answer your question? Sorry. Some questions here? Can I just say one other thing on top of that? We, we haven't mentioned, well, we did, yeah. Korea and the Philippines were both represented in Okinawa, and they are, quote unquote, sovereign nations, you know, that still have huge military presence. Cuba, right, is a sovereign nation, a very defiant sovereign nation, where Guantanamo is, the, where the most egregious, you know, torture practices of the US were conducted. And so, being in a mixed uh, gathering like that, where you have some of the settler colonies like Hawaii and Guahan um, and Puerto Rico, you know, that are under the U.S. empire, and then Korea and the Philippines, out, quote unquote, outside the U.S. empire, and all of us still dealing with this question of non-sovereignty, non-freedom, non-control over our land. So it's, a, it's an important reminder about how the U.S. kind of gets its way, even after you got your cute little sovereignty, you know. Um, I also wanted to add that um, the uh, Ochinanchu, which is the indigenous people of Okinawa, they're still struggling to identify themselves as indigenous by Japan. Because I believe that for Hawaiians, there's the NAGPRA, right? And the federal recognition or like Hawaiians are recognized in a sense as indigenous people. And so that allows certain laws to be developed to advocate for your guys' rights. But for Okinawans, they're not yet like that. They're considered a prefecture of Japan. So it's like a province of Japan. And their identity is not yet differentiated in the dominant se sense. Although a lot of Okinawan youth are coming to the university and really getting educated around how to get their languages back and how to um, understand their identity as different as from the Ryukyu kingdom and not from the Japan management system. So. They're in the development, I think, someday in the future to perhaps have capacity and legal capacity like how Hawaiians do. Um, I wanted to ask if, I don't know if this works, but I wanted to ask if any of the elders ever went to the United Nations to, I mean, I know it takes years and years you know, to even get a status or get an output, but, uh, and then 
Yeah, that's what I want you to ask. I think um, some of the women have gone, but under different entities. Um, a lot of them are part of women's kind of women in development kind of um, the there's a UN night uh, 13 um, 1345 I think it was and it's it's kind of like a, a women's rights agenda and so some women went to those kinds of meetings uh, to advocate for their their situation on militarism and gender and women's rights but as yeah On sure. The, on, I mean, do you guys have a site? Yes, it's a, a WVWS 808. It's there on the bottom of the Oh, it's on the bottom of the paper. Okay, okay. thank you, thank you so welcome. much. I'll put it there tonight. So the, I just wanted to ask, uh, last time there was mar that the United States went to war with Asia, uh, it was World War II, and what happened was they had martial law, they had um, internment camps, they had, it was a very intense period of time. Uh, and with the United States uh, making these sounds of war against China and North Korea again, did you guys have any discussion about what to prepare for if the United States, like how ideas about what Hawaii should be thinking about if they were to go to war with China? If the United States was to go to what that means for Hawaii people? I think that's a really complex question. I mean, we have to remember that the U.S. is the has the largest military in world history, the most expansive military in world history, and a military-industrial complex that fuels the war economy to make sure that we're in a constant state of war. Yeah, so it's not even necessarily about our government, but about I think corporations that are just making more money than any of us could ever imagine. So it's so important to just stay critical of any notion of war that needs to happen, you know? And China as the big evil that, you know, is going to, well, I don't know, take over the U.S. As if the U.S. taking over every place else is the natural state of being that should make us feel relaxed. Um, yeah, um, I don't know. I, I feel like that is, that is our role to... Again, our whole mantra is genuine sovereignty, genuine security. Um, you ask, what does it mean for us here in Hawaii? I think we need to ask that. What makes us feel genuinely secure? You know, most of us will say, a good job, you know, um, a, a secure education for our people, uh, health care for our people, the things that make life worth living. And the more that we're at war, both our country and whatever, all of many countries around the world, the less chance we have of a decent life and for all of those basic security needs to be met. Um, so stay critical, I think, is our, our most important tool. I want to acknowledge Auntie Gwen Kim also in the room. And also Auntie, <laughs> Auntie Kim Kule Bernie, who are also there in Puerto Rico. We have so many kupona here who have just helped us be the organization that we are. Um, also, oh sorry, almost fell. Okay. So to answer the El Kalama's question, I think uh, the person that's been really educational for me to understand at least the North Korean issue and how do we respond from Hawaii, uh, Christine Ahn. She's been really teaching us to look beyond the media propaganda of how we're supposed to be afraid um, of North Korea. And she's been working on the ground to understand what is it that the people in Korea need and what is their vision of... Um, of peace and that's the reunification of the peninsula but we get none education around what that is and, and how to make it happen but I think it's that experience of working with Christine and connecting with movements on the ground helps us to see what they need and then how we're going to therefore respond from here if we're going to support th that effort to to uh, diminish the or to kind of like push back this sort of uh, aggression that usually comes from the U.S. areas, I think. Aloha uh, Kako, you know, Leighton, I spent 42 years in the South Pacific as a merchant mariner. I spent a lot of time in Kwajalein, Johnson Island, 
go on in those areas. Until today, every month, military supplies go in consistently. Every 30 days, a load goes in. It could be whatever, especially Kwajalein. Kwajalein is very sensitive because Kwajalein is one of the key eyes for any missile tracking. People don't realize how strong that is because it's on a little island, but since the 1950s, it has grown so big. And I've seen it grown. I spent 40 years in those areas. So how do you expect as Vahinis or any Kanaka or any, any nation or any sovereign nation, how do you stop it? I mean, you, you're going against one. Tough. It's tough. I mean, even to get an island is tough. And, but, you know, and then, then you jump into, uh, now that Johnson Island is secured. They're, they secured Johnson Island because that's where all the ammunition used to be, uh, the waste was burnt off. They had, they had the uh, inferno there. But now all the fish around there is all tainted. You can't eat the fish there in Johnson. So now they removed everything out of Johnson. Kwajalein is not too far away from it. So your battle is a tough battle. And if you can, I mean, if someone can come on the plan, how are they going to actually uh, have Kwajalein return back to the Micronesians or, or be in a better shape? I mean, you, you got yourself a battle, a big one. But I appreciate whatever you can do. Thank you. Mahalo, Uncle. I, I think we have a battle. We have a battle. Um, but to say, it's not so much to say how, and even if we had the how, I certainly would not share it in such a public forum where I don't know who, who was here. Um, it's not about, it's when. When we will win. So we need to start each place. If, as long Many people don't even know where Johnson Island is. You say Kwajalein, they don't know what Kwajalein is. You say Okinawa, there's like, is that in, isn't that part of Japan? It, so we got to begin with some basic, basic education, and then the absolute belief that we will win. If we go in with the, we will win, maybe not in my life, maybe not in your life, maybe not even in my kid's life, but we will win, because that was the one thing when we were in Okinawa that was so consistent. It wasn't if the bases are gonna leave, it is when the bases are gonna leave. Um, and of course the US is gonna play its games. It's gonna do what it's gonna do. But we've always, we're smarter than the U.S. I mean, so once we trust that we're smarter than that, yes, we're up against a lot. Violence. There's a lot of violence we're facing. But we're also at a very strategic time in history where you start seeing people saying, you know what? This is coming to a head right now. We're tired of this. We're tired of war being the answer for everything. So when we trust in that, then we can start making small moves because the way they did it is like small, like, let me take over a school board. Let me take over this. You know, that's how Trump get in office. Like, I don't know nothing. But then like they, all these little small moves they would make. And the next thing you know, they're taking over the, the whole school board, the, you know, all these things. Right. That's how we have to work. We have to think about how to move. Right. So because all of us have military in our family, it's not like we don't know how they how they think. It's not like we don't know how their strategy works. They're still kind of Cold War the way they think, right? So, um, I mean, I met a wonderful sister that came here from Standing Rock this week. She actually was the person on logistics for Standing Rock. And the reason they were so successful is because she had gone into the military, did logistics for them, took all that training and came back and used it for us. That's the kind of things we got to do. We'll be like, okay, you're going to do that. We're going to take what you gave us and we're gonna use it strategically. It doesn't always work, you know, and there's always the critique of going into military, but if you're gonna be there, find a way to use it, right? So I think, um, I think it's, it's like, when we think about these things, yes, we have a, a really serious battle, but we also have to, to just trust, we have to trust that we're gonna win. We need everybody. Yo, yo, just clap it up, just clap it up for this beautiful Marawahine right here. Women's voices, women speak. I want to mahalo, mahalo. Let's go, let's keep tapping it up, guys. Gotta keep this energy up. Kim Pompa. And Joy, I want to let you guys know that I met.
um, I met these three three years ago, La Hoya Hoya. I'm a baby in this movement, an infant. And Nahua Ea, three years ago, is where I met uh, these beautiful women who shared part of this story. And I want to acknowledge again, we have acknowledge Dr. Terry here, but Dr. Terry is part of one big chorus. So let me get a big half of Dr. Terry, Dr. Quinn, all have to all of our, our Mana Wahine who have been leading the way for how long, you yeah? know? long. As some of you guys know, Aloha Aina, we're not new. We're a long legacy. And that legacy, if you look back, the Mana Wahine, the women, are at the forefront of that legacy. And as a man, I know my positionality. And it's not my man to speak. That's why I want to uh, I wanna make sure that we give and make do. I give a big hand to the women who continue to be part of our leadership, who continue to lead from the front. And us men, sometimes we gotta recognize this. Man, check this out. Check this out. I want you guys to say this, man. Sometimes we gotta step back so we can all step forward. Man, let's go. We gotta step back so we can all step forward. Check that for yourself. That's something I have to recognize for myself. I just thought I'd add that because these beautiful women consistently challenge me to make sure to check myself as a man. And they don't, they don't ever let me slip. So how about that? Big hand for all these women because they always, and for the ones who continue. Now, there's some people who say mano wahine, and these terms not more apply to these women. So I want to mahalo Joy, I want to mahalo Ellen, I want to mahalo Kim, I want to mahalo Kasha, all these women who went to, um, uh, to Okinawa to continue to be forefront of our leaders. Now, I just want to mahalo you ladies. Thank you very much. We got some food going on here, so right here for our speakers, all of our speakers. He's gonna, as you guys make your headway out.